Hey folks, we hope you've had a splendid week. In case you hadn't heard, it's the five-year anniversary of our marketplace. To celebrate, get up to 50% off over 4,000 products before September 3rd. Thank you to all of our wonderful marketplace creators, old and new. Speaking of the marketplace, it's your last chance to grab August's featured free content, including animation sets, magical combat systems, landscapes, footstep sounds, and a versatile VFX system are still available through the 31st. Don't miss out. Panache Digital Games recently released the highly ambitious open world title Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey, which charts the evolution of human history across 8 million years. We caught up with the Montreal based team to see how they're reaching for AAA quality as an indie developer, balancing making a game that is both historically accurate and fun, as well as how they designed a gameplay experience with no predetermined narrative. In the interview, they also provide tips to developers who are thinking of starting their own studio. In an attempt to refine their craft, Supermassive Games set out to create the Dark Pictures Anthology as a collection of horror games that tackle different genre archetypes. Building on their experience with Until Dawn, the studio incorporated both couch and online co-op modes for Man of Medan. Learn how they overcame difficult challenges to design the game's online co-op, which is designed to sync between two players free to explore divergent paths. Plus, read about how Man of Medan has been designed with replayability in mind, making the game the studio's biggest branching game yet. And now on to our weekly Karma Earners. Many thanks to Clockwork Ocean, Shadow River, Matt Gauss, Max Payne, Mighty Enigma, Pavi Pavi, Tisumi Saki, Harry High Death, Indie Game Cove, and MCX292. Thank you so much for helping out on Answer Hub. First up on this week's Community Spotlight is Leah Cronenberg's winning entry for the Legend of King Arthur Art Station Challenge, and here we have Merlin's Cave. It's a gorgeous scene, and you can get a full scene breakdown on their challenge blog. Built entirely using blueprints by two developers, We Ride aims to find the sweet spot between early and modern MMORPGs. We Ride is one of the first MMOs to be developed and funded as part of a three-year research project, allowing the team to explore unique features and mechanics. Last up, we'd like to highlight an asset cleaner tool created using the editor utility widgets. This tool scans all the assets in your project and lists the unused ones. This is super helpful to help reduce project and binary size after all your iterations. Check it out on our forums. Thanks for joining us for this week's News and Community Spotlight. Hey everyone and welcome to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host Victor Broden and with me today to talk about Unreal Insights, our new performance and profiling tool, I have invited Stefan Bubair, our Engineering Director for Foundation, calling in from Stockholm, Sweden, and Jonat Matasaro, our Senior Engine Programmer from Romania, right? Yeah. That is correct. Um, and to start off with this, since I don't know much about the tool, uh, we're going to have Stefan walk us through a little bit of his slide deck that he's prepared for us to give us a little bit of an introduction to what Unreal Insights has to offer. All right, should we get started? Let's see. I'm not sure we have audio. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? I can't. Can Sorry, I don't have any audio here in my in my in ear. Just trying to make sure that I can hear everyone I'm talking to. Do you have audio now? Let's see, just a moment. There we go. I can hear you now, Stefan. You can hear me. Okay. Yes. Excellent. So, um, so yeah, I'm the engineering director for the core and the foundation teams, uh, and I'm based in Stockholm. And um, yeah, so I'm going to start uh, this show by just giving a quick overview of uh, the work we've done, kind of why we did it, and um, just some super high level information um, about how it works. And then Yonitz will uh, do the more interesting stuff, which is to show off how it actually works in practice. 
Um, so uh, just a quick background story. So, so I'm relatively new to Unreal. I started Epic um, at the beginning of last year, and um, it's a huge code base. And so when you start uh, investigating uh, how to solve kind of different problems, the, you get a lot of questions. So in our case, uh, one of our main focuses right now is to optimize loading performance. So digging into that, how that worked, um, how the cooker works, uh, which is another area that our team owns. And, uh, you know, more precisely, where are we spending time during loading? And, uh, well, how does everything work in our reel? Uh, some of these questions are slightly difficult to, to answer because it's very non-visual uh, stuff that's happening. It's very internal to the engine. Um, we have some tools already that provide, you know, some answers and there are external tools that can also help uh, understand uh, what's happening in the engine. Uh, but we felt like there was an opportunity for us to improve how this works and to help us expose just more information, um, mostly for ourselves to help us do our work. Uh, but it's also a great opportunity to, to share these tools, uh, make them really good and share them back uh, to the community to help everyone understand uh, better what's happening. So uh, hence insights, we want to give you insights. Um, and super high level goals is just, like I said uh, earlier, you want to reveal more of the internals to the users. Uh, it's not just um, intended to be for performance uh, and profiling. It's really uh, designed to expose all kinds of information to the user. But the initial focus is performance. And our, our intended audience, uh, especially now, is quite technical users. So primarily the programmers, I would say, uh, though others, very technical users could probably help find them helpful. Um, and uh, I mean, a, a really huge uh, goal for us is to provide really high um, quality interactive tooling to give you really responsive, uh, good feedback, uh, respond quickly. And actually our target, just like with games, we want to have a super high frame rate. So our target with the tool is to give you 60 FPS, if you have a good enough computer, um, give you 60 FPS uh, uh, interactive kind of experience. So, um, and also enable scaling, like really large, large data sets. This is something we've experienced in the past is when we look at something that's taking minutes, um, tools might be okay. But then when you start looking at um, tens of minutes or hours, even when you look at a long running process, then they can start to struggle. So this is another thing that we really want to um, to accomplish. And um, then the other thing is that we don't want to just do something hard coded that only solves one problem. Uh, a big part of this is also just making sure we have foundations for the rest of the engine team to extend this tool to provide more information to allow you to uh, yeah understand what's happening. So. Um, uh, another thing which is probably more interesting to larger game studios and, and larger AAA titles is to label uh, offline analysis, which is really common uh, to do reporting and tracking performance over time, uh, things like that. Um, so uh, in 4.23, we have the first release. It's a beta. Um, it's a result of uh, basically three months work uh, of units and then a bit more time for some of the others. Um, but we only had time to add uh, CPU timing information. Um, and we have log output, you'll see this later. And then an experimental uh, asset loading panel, which we have used internally um, to drive our kind of optimization work. And uh, we currently support in 4.23, we support Windows, Linux, and consoles for tracing. So the tools that you're looking at, the tools you're, uh, sorry, the programs you're investigating can run on these targets right now. Uh, and the tool itself is currently only really tested extensively on Windows. Uh, but the goal is to, uh, of course, is to support all targets uh, both for both of these. Uh, all desktop targets for the tool, all our supported runtime targets um, for tracing. Um, you can also run uh, the tools with any Unreal program. It's not just for a game. Some tools are heavily focusing on like have concepts of frames and 
other things that mean that they don't uh, tend to work very well for other things. For example, the editor. Um, uh, another thing which is different compared to other tools that we have in the engine is that with insights, you can actually look at the startup uh, of the game, for example, to see what, what, what's taking time there. And uh, you can also analyze the cooker and uh, the server, for example, uh, to investigate performance. And we are internally doing just that. Um, so on a super high level, um, I want to explain just roughly how it works. So you'll uh, have an idea when you see the tool later. So you'll have your game or your program running. Um, this uh, generates events. So code is uh, just instrumented to generate a bunch of events uh, that we send over the network to a recording application, which is currently embedded in the tool. Uh, and this records uh, the information to files. So you can look at them later. Uh, but you can also look at them live. So you can use this tool that you'll see um, to investigate uh, and look at the information in these uh, traces. And you can also run uh, batch tools to generate reports, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's super easy if you, you have a bit of code that you want to add, um, your own code, for example, that you want to investigate, then it's quite easy. You just add a scope. Uh, macro, uh, which is obviously covered in the documentation. Um, we also cover existing instrumentation. Um, so the uh, classic stats annotations that we have in the engine also work. And uh, you can also add bookmarks for making it easier to sort of find things on a timeline. Uh, and units will show that later. And actually right now, that's it for, you know, hopefully gives you a, a quick overview of, of what we're looking at soon here and how that works. Yeah, it's exciting. So. Let's see. Let's see, Yonit, if you're able to um, take over the screen share. Yep. OK. Let's do that. It's OK. The yeah. screen is showing. It should be a black screen yes. for now. Uh, before launching uh, Arial Insights, I want to tell that in uh, 423, Arial Insights will come pre-built. It's a standalone application. You'll find it in uh, as a binary folder and it's just easy as double-clicking on, on running Arial Insights.exe. Uh, if you have uh, Arial Insights from and you want to compile it from sources, uh, the project is Arial Insights. Uh, you'll find it in programs. Just compile from Visual Studio and run it. Uh, One moment there. I think we message. had a small ch uh, screen share chat hiccup. Let's see here. That call dropped. This will take just a moment, and we will be able to get um, Yonet's screen back up on our screen so that we can all see what you're actually doing over there. Should just take a moment. Yes, we've connected, and okay. I think we are sure. almost back. Let me make sure I um, get this over to the right window, <coughs> and we are good. All right. Okay. I will start on the alien sites. Uh, when we'll open, uh, you'll see the start page. In the start page, we have the list of uh, trace uh, sessions, also trace sessions that Arial uh, Insights knows about. Each uh, trace session corresponds to a real uh, recorded uh, trace file that is located in local session directory. I can browse um, the folder to see the files. That will be easy if you want to manage uh, yourself uh, you know, the files, clean up all the all traces or share it with someone else. Uh, to open analysis for a certain trace file, it's as easy as uh, clicking on um, uh, selecting and um, opening the session. I will not do uh, this right now. Or double-clicking um, on um, on the trace session. You can also load another file if it's located in, a, in another folder. Uh, before showing the actual analysis, I will show how you'll create one of uh, the trace sessions. For that, I will start the uh, editor. 
it will take a few seconds to start. You'll see that uh, a new trace session has appeared and uh, it is live, so it's producing um, events uh, right now. Started, I'm loading uh, infiltrator demo project. A new session is created. Just a few seconds. And when I will have um, um, the editor open, what I want to ensure is I, I will want to, to play infiltrator demo in a standalone application. What I want to do is to, to be able to capture performance timing uh, events. And for that, I will need to specify one command line. I'll show immediately. I will go to settings, and then settings, and CPU profiler trace is a command line that I will need to specify. Uh, enabling that will allow tracing to to trace all timing uh, informations. I will also specify low timing trace. This is for uh, asset loading uh, events. I will show more about uh, uh, later. But what is important is that now, um, if you want uh, timing information, you need to specify that. In the future, we want to get rid of uh, the need of specifying in command line and to be able to control those uh, um, events to turn on of uh, this kind of events live directly from uh, UI. So I have that specified and I'm starting Infiltrator Demo as a standalone uh, game. You will see the actual session for uh, Infiltrator Demo is the third one. The other ones are still producing events, and Ariel in Science is recording uh, uh, those sessions as well. Just okay. I'm start. I'm starting the demo. Demo playing the background. What I'll do? I will actually open analysis in uh, real time. So that will produce events. Uh, I will go more into details of what you are seeing here uh, immediately after. Just to know that here it's um, duration of frames. So you'll see frame durations. And what I will do, I will try to pause a game loop just by moving the window a little bit. And that will create a frame, oh, because the main, main, uh, main loop is a pause, it will create a longer frame. And you see that spike here. I'll do that again, I'll pause. When I release it, you'll, you'll see again uh, a spike here. I'll close it now. You see the two pause that I made, and at the end, some um, exit events. I could close also the other ones. And you'll see that now the session are closed. And I'll continue analysis for, um, uh, for the session that I, I just created. Um, first, as an overview, we have a timing view that will show scopy timers um, per thread for, uh, for, for each thread. We have on the right uh, a list of uh, all the timers and with aggregated statistics. We have on top um, the frames with duration for both the game and rendering frames. And on the bottom, we have a, a log view. I will show more uh, more details first about uh, the log view. Uh, it's a basic functionality. The log view is similar with uh, the one from editor. Uh, you are uh, you'll be able to filter by um, a text. You can filter by categories. For example, I could hide all categories and enable only one of them, like that. I'm showing again, or you can filter by threshold. That is a bit different than um, um, filtering in the editor because that is an actual threshold. So if you uh, specify a want only from warning, it will disable um, verbosities lower in priority than that and will enable all the one uh, above that uh, priority. So that will show warning error fatal. I don't have any, so that's good. Then, uh, I don't know if you notice when I click, when I select it, um, one message, the view has has tried to, to center on uh, on that um, um, 
on time of the respective log message, you know, in this case, this bookmark. Um, because I see that bookmark and uh, Stefan also mentioned the trace book, bookmark macro, these bookmarks are not um, actual uh, category field, uh, categories, low categories, uh, are generated by uh, the respective trace macro. Those are used in a timing view to have you know, an orientation over the bigger picture of uh, the session. So if you see those vertical lines, those corresponds all to, each one will correspond to uh, a bookmark. And when I selected one, I have it, uh, this one. I'm zooming again. If I go to the next one and see, if I'm just continue selection, you'll see that uh, the marker will move to the time of uh, respective message. Another thing that uh, I can do is to make a selection. So if I'm selecting one message and then keeping shift press and selecting another message, the entire time between first and um, second click will be selected. So it'll be selected from time here, from time here, and that will be correlated to uh, selection here. Uh, coming back on uh, bookmarks, so again, you see, just zooming out to see a lot of bookmarks. If that will be too noisy, you can collapse the bookmarks by clicking on the bookmarks header or by double clicking anywhere in the bookmark uh, track. Um, you can also enable, you know, instead of showing only bookmarks, to show the markers for all the logs. That is uh, currently available as a shortcut. So B will control the bookmarks and M will control all the logs. Now you can see all the logs that are uh, available in the session will be also used as markers. In a... That will be more useful when you zoom in and you want more context um, information for, um, for timing events. I'm coming back to bookmarks. Um, I will just minimize the log view. Now more about the uh, timing view. So first, each track that you'll see here that show an, uh, an icicle graphs represents a, uh, a, C a CPU thread. Um, the timing view is not limited to CPU threads, but in this view currently that all, all, uh, all tracks are CPU, uh, CPU threads. You'll see the hierarchy of the timing events. Uh, as a navigation, uh, just to navigate to panning, it's around it just a click of a mouse and dragging uh, the window. You'll see that is very responsive. Uh, to zoom in and zoom out, I'm just using a scroll, uh, scroll bar on a, a scroll wheel on uh, the mouse. So just you can have an, an overview of, you know, maybe you can have a one hour session, you can see that and then you can zoom in and go to things that are probably nanoseconds in, uh, in time or even smaller. And uh, then to, uh, in order to easily navigate between uh, uh, a lot of information, because sometimes you could have hundreds of uh, threads. Um, in, the, in this case, are probably are not too many, but you could have much more than that. Uh, we have a way to turn off, off visibility for uh, for tracks. First, you can enable disable all tracks at once, and then you can enable only uh, groups of tracks based on uh, uh, thread groups, on CPU thread groups. So I can, for example, enable only the free render um, threads and game thread. Um, another thing that uh, if you notice, when timing events are going out of the view, the scope will, will try to collapse. So we'll, we'll use the space as best as possible. For example, here we have a lot of space. When I'm moving that around, you'll see that those will come together. So you'll always have information in context and close to uh, one to another. Uh, if you don't want uh, tracks to be hidden when they don't have any event, you can disable that. So that will see that there are additional uh, threads. Uh, in my filter, but in that, uh, at this zoom level, you, uh, you don't have um, any timing events. And those will increase in size once uh, the events will appear. I'm just hiding that. When you hover mouse over a timing event, 
just like that. You see basic information like inclusive time, which is a duration of the time event, and exclusive time. So it's time minus duration of the children events. Uh, you can also select a timing event. So when you select it, it will start to, to flash. Uh, once it's selected, you can use a keyboard to navigate between adjacent uh, timing events. So I'm pressing uh, left up, uh, left, right, uh, up, down, um, uh, arrow keys. When I press right, I just go to the next event. And you see those. Then there are a few smaller, smaller events here. If I press up, it will go to parent event. If I press down, it will go to the largest uh, child event. So to navigate between events. Because uh, some events are larger, some are smaller. Uh, in order to, to keep focus on, on that, uh, you can press F key, and that will frame the view to uh, zoom around uh, the respective event. So that is a long one. It will center and uh, uh, compute the zoom based on the size of the event. If I'm going to a smaller one and press F, now that smaller one is here. Um, another thing that you can do once you have um, a timing given selected, you can press Enter. And that will select the time range corresponding to the respective timing events. Or you can just double click a timing event and it will do the same. A little bit about uh, frame struck. Uh, as uh, I said earlier, uh, on the frame struck show duration of frames. Those are, are not on a, a timeline, but uh, on an index line. So they are adjacent frame, uh, frames one uh, uh, near the others. You'll see like a, a bar graph. So each bar is a frame. You see both rendering and render and uh, game frames in an overlapping mode. When you and when you hover the mouse over them, you can identify which is which. So in this case, the smaller one is render frame, and the bigger one is game frame. Uh, you notice that some of the frames are highlighted with red. Those are uh, highlighted based on duration. Uh, the ones that are bigger than 33 milliseconds, so corresponding to uh, less than 30 frames per second, will be highlighted with red and uh, between 40 and 60 frames per second should be highlighted with orange, greenish color. So that will be easy to spot uh, spikes or frames with uh, large duration. Um, this frame is useful to, to navigate uh, if you are interested of identifying one spike and going there. So you, you can just click on, on that event and the time, uh, click on, um, on that frame and the time of the frame will be selected and uh, the timing view will um, um, will center on, on the respective um, time range. So it's easy to navigate around like clicking like that. So this is the actual frame that I'm clicking. This is a large uh, pause that I made, so nine seconds, and this should be the second pause that I made. Uh, there is also the white bracket you see here. The white brackets uh, shows approximately approximately um, how many frames uh, you see in the timing view, because have a different horizontal scales. Uh, basically, all the frames from here are visible in uh, this timing view. When I'm scrolling left right, you see that the brackets are uh, are moving. Okay, I show that making a, a selection can be done by clicking on the frames here. You can select from uh, from the log. You can select by selecting a, a timing event and uh, pressing enter or double clicking a timing event. You can also make a custom selection just by drag clicking and dragging on the time ruler. So if I'm just doing that, you can make custom uh, uh, time range selections. If you are doing the same on the main view, it will make a panning uh, of the view. Um, the selecting is just uh, clicking in uh, an empty space. Um, 
every time a selection, a time selection is made, you see that aggregated statistics are updated automatically uh, to include statistics only for timing events in, um, in the respective uh, selection. Uh, as um, aggregated statistics that you'll see for uh, each timer events, uh, in the default view, you'll see total inclusive time and total exclusive time, which is uh, obvious. It's the uh, sum of uh, all the instances in, uh, in selection. Uh, what is important is that if you have a selection that only partially intersect up longer timing events, like in this case, uh, this one, uh, only the time range that is intersecting the, uh, intersecting with uh, the selection will be considered. So in this case, this timing even have 14 seconds. Um, but in, um, um, in the four seconds that I'm selecting, it's only having 2.3 seconds. So that uh, uh, it would be useful when you make selection for big events or if you just make uh, ad hoc uh, uh, time range selection. Uh, more about the timers uh, list. So first you have uh, that list of all the timers. Um, you can sort by uh, any of uh, aggregated uh, statistics. So I'm by default, I'm sorted by inclusive time, but I could just sort by count by how many instances are in the, in the selection. Um, another useful thing to know is that statistics are also computed only for timing events that are filtered but i currently filter in the view so if you have the tracks uh, hidden it will not be cons it will not be considered for example if i'm just keeping um, um, only one um, uh, one track uh, visible those stats will include only what is visible now will not include uh, information from uh, from other tracks or other uh, CPU threads. This is to in order to be able to focus on the threads that you want to investigate. If you want to, to be included, it's just as simple as uh, um, you can keep uh, everything visible. So in this case, statistics we include uh, timing information of all the timing events. Okay. Another thing to know is that we don't have only inclusive and exclusive. We have uh, more statistics. Those will be visible here. So we have minimum, maximum, average, and median values for each inclusive uh, and uh, exclusive times. For example, I could uh, reset the view to include uh, more stats. Again, you can sort uh, by any of those columns. You can sort alphabetically. Uh, you can search by uh, my world. And now I will want to show you something more about uh, the navigation. I could hide uh, um, the views. I will just keep uh, timing uh, information visible. So again, now I have all the tracks uh, visible. I could just enable, okay, everything is uh, visible. And I have lots and lots of um, uh, of tracks. Again, it could be much more than that. One way to, to have a better overview over those is to press C key, which, you, which will go in a compact mode. And then you can see things like that. And you start to see patterns on um, execution of uh, threads. You see that at some point, a lot of threads are, you can zoom in and see what's happening there. You can press C again and go in a uh, more detailed view. You can do that uh, at any point in time. So expand, collapse uh, the view. We try to make navigation because um, we try to provide access to a lot, a lot of data. It could be millions and millions of uh, small timing events. And our goal was to be able to navigate between a um, high overview to something that is very small, nanoseconds, very, very fast and very effective to, uh, to be able to go there where, where you want to go. Um, what I'll show you a little bit about uh, asset loading. 
asset loading, as Stefan said, uh, was made more, more, more as an experiment or something to, to, to help us. It will show that in addition to, to threads, you could also have other kind of information, other, other kind of uh, tracks. In this case, game thread is a CPU thread. It's a, uh, the same CPU thread li like uh, the one, uh, like the one here. But loading main thread here, it's a special track with uh, special events related to asset loading. You'll see that when I hover the mouse over that, I have completely different information. I have much more information related to um, uh, asset loading. Um, if you make a selection, you can have some aggregated uh, statistics related to um, asset loading uh, info. Again, that is just an experiment. Uh, we'll probably need to expose more in, in the future, but we'll show that uh, we can correlate different kind of information. So we don't want to be only uh, CPU uh, timing events. Uh, if we have any kind of information that have um, a timestamp, we will be able in the future to uh, to correlate and to visualize in the same um, uh, the same view. I think that's the most uh, important things that I wanted to show you for the tool. And I think I can show also a glimpse of what we are working right now and things that will come in uh, future versions. That sounds good. There's quite, quite a bit there to uh, dig into. Mm -hmm. So, so and, uh, one uh, big thing there that's hopefully obvious is that one of the goals is to try and um, collect a lot of different information and uh, allow you to look at it together. So you could see a, a small glimpse of that there where you can see the loading information at the same time as some of the CPU information and the log. So to be able to correlate different uh, classes of information together to be able to um, analyze problems. For example, when you have hitches, you can see, oh, it's loading a sublevel, and at the same time, uh, a bunch of other things happened, and this is why I'm um, dropping frames in my game, for example. So, um, yeah, and that's what we'll be looking at here as well, is just in a, additional examples of that whole idea. So, yeah, you want to, you want to show this? That's... Yeah. yeah. So this version is what we are working uh, right now. So that is will not be in 4.23. Uh, you see that there are you know, small UI improvements. Uh, but what I want to, to show is um, that we have first uh, stats counters. Stats counter are uh, hooking to existing uh, stats counters functionality from, uh, from Arial. And they are tracking um, variation over time of all those uh, counters. Uh, I could make um, a selection just to, to compute. I will sort by count just to identify the one with. Um, and I will show that. When you press G key, it will show a special track that is uh, docked on top, but is correlated to the timing view. By default, it show frame information. So it will show game and rendering frames. I could hide those. Um, because not those I want to show. And what I will show that every variation of uh, stats counters could be graphed uh, um, and could be correlated with um, uh, timing view. So I, I, I will double click on Vertus buffer memory and you'll see immediately the graph uh, for that. Um, I will show that. So you'll see a graph that seems pretty simple, looks like a flat line and something that doesn't have a variation. Uh, I choose that just to uh, uh, just to showcase uh, some of the features uh, that I'll, uh, I will just show. Not uh, uh, the timer itself is not uh, is not important. Uh, but when I will start to uh, to zoom in, this graph will automatically zoom. Um, uh, vertically in order to fit uh, minimum and maximum value uh, that is visible in uh, in the view. So when I'm zooming in here, 
you'll see that things will start to, to, to zoom in. So now I'm starting to see more patterns here. You see that I'm zooming. It's still flat, but I'm zooming more. You'll see more patterns. And now I'm going to a frame level and you'll see a pattern that is correlated to exact actual frames. Again, there are things that seems pretty, pretty flat, but when you zoom in, you'll see the pattern for, for them. So that you can do with any, um, any timer that is uh, available. I want to show an interesting variation. I will enable again the rendering uh, frames. And we have two uh, spikes. And I could look on uh, what's happening in that spike. So I see a frame that uh, took uh, 73 milliseconds. I see in the timing events that's something related to garbage collection. So yeah, probably that was the reason. Uh, I see that this variation have the same pattern before and after and pretty the same, uh, the same value. I'm looking again on the second uh, spike and now I'm seeing something interesting. I'm seeing a pattern before, I'm seeing the pattern after, but I'm seeing that during the spike, uh, this vertex buffer memory has increased. So that one I could you know, uh, get the conclusion that have something to do with, um, uh, with the spike or the spike itself cause uh, the increase in memory. And that is important because it's not a, uh, a spike in, uh, in that memory. That memory remains at that level after this uh, frame spike. Again, that could be important or not. I, I'm just I'm just trying to showcase things that you can uh, investigate and things that could appear, different patterns that could appear when you look on different uh, counters or stars counters. Um, another interesting stats that I want to show is scene lights. And you see that have a certain pattern. If you zoom in even more, you can see more details of what's happening there. So you can correlate if you have more information, more timing events with what's happening with uh, this counter, why it's you know, having these uh, oscillations. But more interesting is when I start to zoom out and you'll start to, to see patterns like that. So it's not only, again, if you just see an overview, it looks pretty flat, but when you see it at this level, you already see the pattern. And it seems that is something regular with uh, uh, roughly two seconds um, uh, period. And again, it's something that you can find. It could be you know, useful to, uh, to know about those, but it will depend on what, uh, what kind of um, stats you are looking on. But it's interesting to, to look on that. And again, you can do that with any kind of uh, timers. And yeah, that's all that I want to, to show. That's great. I guess, and I guess there are some hints as well in the tabs, which I don't think you can click on, uh, but uh, to sort of highlight some of the other stuff that we're adding, uh, which is uh, additional views like for networking, uh, to be able to look at uh, server and client uh, information about what they're receiving uh, to be able to investigate sort of network. Um, yeah, what, what's going on on the network stack and see what's being replicated and uh, how big that becomes. And uh, there are some hints about GPU, I think, when you look at some of the timing tracks, there's a GPU tab. Um, that's something that's actually not in the release because there were some issues and uh, we're on a tight schedule. So that is actually disabled in 4.23, uh, but the goal is to include that as well on this timeline. And so will Unreal Insights replace our current network profiling tool that also ships with the engine? So the goal, so it's, I guess when you look at this, uh, if you're familiar with the tools that exist uh, before this, um, you'll see that some of this information already existed in a slightly different, uh, well, set of tools. Um, and our goal is not to just add to those, to add yet another one. Uh, the goal is to kind of converge uh, and, and put all the information 
that makes sense into uh, this framework instead. So that's something that we're uh, working on partially with the networking team, for example. Uh, and yes, is the answer that the goal is to just have that here and uh, ultimately deprecate the old one. That's great. Uh, same same thing for the profiler. And uh, so we want to just make sure we add all the functionality that already exists. Um, for example, on the CPU timing, if you look at the uh, existing profiler before this, it had a butterfly, butterfly view, so you could see um, chill hierarchical information in a different way. Uh, that's something we need to add. Uh, but once we have all the features, then we can deprecate the old tooling. And that makes it a little easier for um, people who are just sort of starting out learning how to profile the, um, their games or, or projects. Uh, since I, I, I assume that the, the tool itself and the UI will be very similar, and so you don't have to jump between different interfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the goal is to make it easier also for people to collect um, if they have a, someone testing the game and they run into an issue, that they can just uh, tr switch on tracing and record a trace, and that will include uh, all the different types of information. So it's just one file. Um, some of those things can be a little bit more awkward today when you have uh, different ways of collecting information, it can be in many different files. Uh, so with this, you can collect it even over the network is the goal. Uh, if you have a playtest, for example, uh, I've been on uh, teams in the past where we've done similar things and just collected um, these traces over network. So a playtest with 60 or 100 people um, were just tracing things to a central server that programmers could um, look at after a playtest, for example. So, uh, I just yeah. want to, to show, just want to show those um, checkboxes that are disabled right now, but those are the ones that I told earlier about um, trying to remove the need of command line options. So in the future, you'll be able to just enable timing, uh, directly from here. You just start uh, the application without any additional options. Trace is enabled by default. And when you want to enable tracing of um, uh, CPU timing information, you'll just check uh, that and uh, the incoming stream will, will receive also timing information. Mm. And, and that's a general theme, I guess. Uh, the, the preview, or sorry, the beta that's in 4.23 is um, something we're aware that some of the workflows around collecting information, etc. they're not as slick as we'd like them to be, but that's uh, something we're improving. That's great. Uh, we've received a couple of questions. Are you good to answer mm -hmm. some of them? All right. Yes. Um, so I think it would help to clarify a little bit that Unreal Insights is a standalone tool that you run uh, either alongside or um, or, or completely standalone from the editor. And one of the questions it, were... It is always standalone application for now. So you can just run it as a standalone application. And then, okay, so one of the questions were, if it was possible to uh, access one or more of the real-time track statistics info uh, via console command or even better via blueprint command. And so, as far as I know, I don't think there's any communication between the editor and the tool. Is that correct? Uh, no, at this point, no. But uh, we will support for um, um, analysis of the timing events, also a CLI interface. So we can write command line analyzers that will just process the events in some way and generate the reports uh, based on that. This is what uh, Stefan mentioned in uh, the presentation. Yeah, so I think the question is actually more like if you're working in the editor and you want to trigger something or um, basically investigate something in the editor, uh, can you do that and can you even script it or control it through blueprints? I mean, the, uh, the answer is right now, uh, no. Uh, but we're interested in different problems that people are in, want to solve. So. Um, the, the whole question of exactly how we integrate this in different ways into the uh, editor and everything else is still kind of open for debate. Uh, we're not entirely sure uh, what the end state is, but 
some teams are interested in exposing more information in the editor as well. And that's something that's possible since this is all in Slate. It is possible to embed. Uh, we're just not sure if that makes sense yet. So a little bit of research to do. Yeah, and for those of you who aren't aware, Slate is the um, underlying system that the editor also runs on. That's right, and, the, and yeah. uh, that's actually what enables us to build this tool very quickly. So the the, use, the graphical tool was built in three months, um, and a lot of the responsiveness and other things is thanks to Slate, I would say. That's great. Are there some top 10 things or best practices within the tracks and timing events to look for? Um, so I guess that's more of a question around like the actual sort of looking, investigating, looking for uh, issues uh, in your code, perhaps, or if I interpret that. Perhaps I, I think you're right. Sort of what, what are some of the, uh, the top 10 things that you might want to look out for, maybe? Yeah. So. So some of the things are maybe obvious uh, and um, like garbage collection, et cetera, spikes, just things that visually look irregular, like, um, cause if you want to smooth the frame rate, then yes. I mean, looking for things that stand out or take a long time. Um, apart from that, uh, if m more kind of common problems with uh, games, that's harder for us to answer actually, because we're not, we're low level kind of coders, we haven't actually used this to solve game level problems ourselves. Um, we focused more on low level uh, type of problems, uh, which tends to be around garbage collection and uh, loading performance, like I said earlier. But lots of other game teams are starting to use this for all kinds of different problems. So I'm sure we'll be able to share something more, um, yeah, some, some more tips like that later. Is it but definitely for the future networking insights will provide more information about networking so it's completely different than uh, performance timing but we'll see that uh, you'll be able to correlate information with the timing so because all the analysis of different uh, kind of data will be done together it's not uh, just ending a new profiler or uh, a new investigation all of those will work together so you'll be able to see the logs timing information, network information, asset loading information, all in the same time for the same session. All right. Um, is it current? Uh, are we shipping the Unreal Insights binary with the preview releases of the engine? Is it currently available? I believe so, yes. Right, Jonas? Uh, can I get the question again? Um, is the binary, sorry, is the binary in the release? Uh, I think yes, it is, right? Yes, You're this is what I started, yes. Uh, on, uh, on the release, it comes pre-built. It is built in, uh, uh, as a development application, but you'll see that uh, Arial insights.exe. So you can just run it, double click on it, or you can uh, compile it from sources, uh, compile it from Visual Studio and just run it. No additional configuration, it just works. <laughs> So development um, or build for development is shipping with the binary, but then if you want it for um, for something else, you can compile you it can from compile source. You can compile for shipping, for example, yeah. That's great. Um, let's see. Uh, what is the file path to f find, find a binary? I will, I will not be able to, to share it more. Let's Just see. Just one sec. Uh, so engine binaries win64 and then will be Arial insights. I will go ahead and uh, share that with everyone on the announcement post as well so that mm. um, it's a little easier to just copy a link and paste it into Explorer than trying to listen to someone reading uh, reading it off. Yeah. Um, and this is another area where we do want to improve and make things a little bit more uh, discoverable and accessible. Um, but right now you have to kind of run it, find it and run it yourself. It's in beta and we're, uh, I'm excited to see some, some feedback and see how people use it and uh, what they're able to mm. track down um, using it. Let's see, um, do the colored bars have a color, color rule or not? Like red for critical, green for good, performance, etc. 
for the frames um, track, yes. For uh, the timing view, uh, no, the timing view are uh, uh, at this point, uh, are uh, each color is assigned um, um, in a way that will try to uh, to make distinction between timing events. It's a pseudo random assign, uh, assignation of colors to timing to timers. Yeah, it's more to be able to see the different events uh, clearly. We had a, another question. And also, I'll try to emphasize. So it also try to emphasize uh, contrast against background, because you have a gray background, and um, timing events will have a lighter um, way of computing the colors, and also they have some uh, special um, backgrounds that will emphasize even more the contrast of uh, time events, especially to make distinct, uh, to make very easy. A distinction between one big timing event compared with a lots of small timing events of the same type. Nice. Uh, let's see. I think I have one more question here. Just, just some clarification. Some, uh, some people wondering if you need to know any code or if you can use it in blueprints. And this is once again an uh, entirely standalone application that you can sort of learn even if you're not a programmer um, or, or, or or you know blueprint. You should be able to. Um, profile and, and track this down. Something we haven't added is an ability to uh, use Blueprint to, well, annotate your Blueprint to see, um, you know, understand performance of your Blueprint code. Um, what we showed was the way that currently exists to add uh, these scopes that you can see. That's only in C++ code. Uh, for Blueprints, we don't have any um, Functionality, yeah, I but... think it may be possible to generate stats with the existing stats system. I'm not sure if uh, uh, that functionality ex is exposed from Blueprint, but I have a vague idea that it could be possible. Because once you'll have uh, um, scope timers uh, stats, you'll be you'll be able to to see that. But uh, of course, with uh, with a newer version. Mm. What are uh, some of the next steps you mentioned moving it over to the other desktop platforms? Will we ever see <clears throat> the possibility to uh, use Unreal Insights to um, to grab logs from external devices like mobile and? Uh, yes. Already, yeah, we are already so, supporting so we... platforms. So, uh, so we can already uh, capture traces from uh, Xbox One, PlayStation. Linux, and of course, uh, um, next will be to, to support all targeted pl platforms. So this is yeah, our we, we support uh, yeah, Switch and uh, other consoles. Um, iOS and Android is underway. So I mean, the goal is to support all of those, um, both over network, but also on device, um, to, to a file on the device, um, because network is not always uh, a good option if you only have Wi-Fi, for example. Yes, usually not. Um, <laughs> what were um, what were some of the challenge and challenges that you um, you came across when you when you started development on on the tool? Yeah, so so some of them, um, as I mentioned earlier, performance was really key for us, and that means um, that some of the code that we um, have written to actually uh, generate this information, write it out at the runtime. Uh, since a lot of the code that we're uh, using this or the problems that we're using for is performance, uh, one of the challenges is to allow you to measure performance without without actually influencing performance too much. So one challenge was to make this uh, tracing framework that I discussed earlier really lean and low overhead. So in the previous release, um, it uh, has more overhead than we have now. Um, we've made it better, but yeah, that's one challenge, just making it scalable and uh, so you can trace out lots of information without really adding more, a lot more overhead. And the other side was, of course, just figuring out how to present this and process the information uh, in this way that allows us to, to look at the huge big picture at the same time, allow you to sort of drill down to the detail that means you can't use uh, the most naive and easy 
solution uh, to do that. So I had to, well, so I guess basically performance was uh, the big challenge. It's relatively easy to do something that does this, but making it really scale and efficient is uh, was one of the big challenges for us, I would say. Um, yeah, some I don't know what units units thinks about that. But, yeah, uh, yeah, for me was also the challenge of learning uh, using Slate in the same time as developing this tool. And by surprise, that was much easier than I was. I thought it's right. Basically, I yeah. was able to write this tool from scratch, learning the framework, the UI framework from scratch. So, and uh, yeah, you yeah, do that was super quickly in uh, three months. So what you're seeing was written from, uh, he started in March, and then we're releasing this. Uh, basically, the code is from early uh, June, and that's the time frame where he came in not knowing anything to uh, delivering that tool that we saw. It's very impressive. Yeah, but it also speaks to um, the framework that we have in the engine for building UI and everything. Yeah, there, there is also a lot of experimentation. So they are not all, it's not always uh, well known what, what is the best way to present data, how to navigate, or uh, what are the best shortcuts. So we're experimenting and iterating and you know, trying to make it better. And that's the way it goes. Um, was there something that you learned during the development uh, that surprised you and might might be um, good to share with our viewers? Yes, for, for UI, that you can do uh, much more uh, rich UI that I thought uh, about initially. So we are able to uh, to show that navigation from tens of millions of events to um, uh, small events of nanoseconds at 60 frames per second. And we can have things that are animated. Now, the user interface could be really fluid, and um, we can achieve that. I, we are not sure at the beginning when we started, but yeah, we are starting to you know, to see the path, to see what we can do with, uh, with the tool. And I think uh, the other thing uh, was really, uh, like I said earlier, one of my um, the ambition with this whole effort, the reason why I wanted to do it in the first place was that we have problems to solve in the engine uh, to do with performance and a bunch of other things. And like I said, we had lots of questions. And that was actually one of the results uh, at the end uh, in, in June when we finally got the loading view, for example, that we just kind of give you a glimpse of. Um, when we had that, suddenly had that information um, really visible and easy to uh, digest, then that was a wow moment for me when I actually understood uh, a ton of stuff about the acid loading process that we needed to know, to know where we should focus our work. So that really highlights the kind of value of having a tool that allows you to expose information that you can actually action. And that's the key thing for me is just to, the whole goal of this tool is to give you information that you can use uh, some insights uh, so for you to use to solve problems. Uh, and to me, that whole thing just um, confirmed that the, this was the right thing to do. Is that when you came up very, with the name, when, when, you, uh, when you had the insight? Um, no, I think, I'm not sure. I think we had that on and off earlier. Yonitz came up with it um, as a suggestion, and yeah, it stuck. It, actually, the name, it's representative for, for what it does. It show insights in how Unreal Engine works. There are things that are coming from, from Unreal Engine. All the trace information events, we try to expose and to try to visualize and uh, analyze that information from the engine. So, and was something that uh, we settled pretty early on on this name. Yeah, yeah I and the definitely goal think is, it works. Yeah, I mean the goal is just to add more. So, so right now it's kind of the basics, but um, we we intend to do a lot more. That's great. Uh, with that, I am done with the questions, and unless you guys have anything else you'd like to share. Uh, no, thank you. It's been awesome to get a chance to show off uh, the work of our team. And uh, yeah, there's more to come, I guess. Yeah. Thank you.
yeah, I think yeah, everyone cheers. appreciates all the work time. that uh, <laughs> all those. We're not over just yet. I have a little bit of a an outro spiel that I go through before before mm -hmm. we uh, before we end the uh, the live stream. But with that, I, I appreciate that you guys both took some time to prepare material for today and and all the hard work you're putting in. Um, and if you're watching this later on YouTube and we're following live, or if there was a part of the stream that you that you want to dig into a little bit deeper, but you don't really remember uh, where that was. Uh, in, in a couple of days, usually within a week, we post our transcript of the live stream, which are being done for captions. Um, together with the timestamps, there will be a link in the YouTube description. And if you're looking for a specific term, you can. Uh, my tip is that you go in there and you can control F and search for the term, and then you can actually find where we said or mentioned that throughout the stream. And you can specifically see the timestamp and go to that section of the video, and you'll be able to find it a little bit quicker than sort of trying to scrub through and uh, with the chance of missing it. Uh, and as always, if you would like to let us know how we did today, what you liked, what you didn't like, or what you would like to see in the future, uh, Amanda's going to go ahead and post a survey link in the chat. Uh, please let us know. Everyone who participates and provides us with their email uh, will be able to put you in a sweepstake for a Unreal Engine t-shirt. And if you would like to go ahead and meet other Unreal Engine developers around the world, you can go ahead and go to unrealengine.com slash user dash groups. Um, and you can go ahead and see if there are any meetups close to you in your area. If there are none and you, you know that there are people in the area who would like to get together and talk about Unreal, uh, go ahead and send us an email at community at unrealengine.com and we can go ahead and give you a little bit of information what it, would, what it can be like being a meetup group organizer. Um, we also do our five minute countdown at the beginning of our streams. Uh, that is 30 minutes of development that we speed up to five minutes. If you go ahead and send that to same e same email, community at unrealengine.com, together with a logo of your project, uh, you might become one of our countdowns. And as always, let us know about all the projects that you're working on. The forums are a great place to do that. But I'd also recommend Unreal Slackers, which is our unofficial Unreal 4 Discord server, where a lot of developers, I think we just might have reached over 26,000 users, which uh, is absolutely amazing. And then follow us on social media. And if you go ahead and stream Unreal Engine on Twitch, make sure that you use the tag so that we can come in and see what you're working on. And with that said, once again, I want to thank Stefan and Jonat for coming on. And next week, we will be announcing the winners of the Summer UE4 Jam. And so tune in for that if you're excited to see, uh, see us play some of the games that won. And uh, also, yeah, we will be announcing the winners. So until next week, bye Jonat and bye Stefan. Uh, we say goodbye, and I'll see you again next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.